All right, so let's jump straight into this first chapter. Um, this will be chapter 11 in the Tro book. Um, this chapter pretty much talks about some properties of matter, um, like intermolecular forces, phase changes, um, that sort of thing. So we'll start out with just sort of um, a cool idea, and we'll break into why this occurs and what makes this happen. So what we have is a gecko. So we're pretty familiar with these in Texas, I feel like. You maybe see them outside your house, stuck on the wall. And you may have wondered from time to time, how exactly are they able to do that? So why can they stick to the wall like that? Well, as it turns out, if you were to zoom way in on the fingers of the gecko, there's just millions and millions and millions and millions of these tiny hair-like structures, so all over their fingertips. Okay. And what that does is it essentially infinitely raises the surface area between them and the wall. So it maximizes the contact between their hands and the wall. So therefore, they're able to actually stick to the wall through what we call intermolecular forces. And we'll get to that in just a few minutes, exactly what I mean by that. Um, but just kind of keep that in mind that that's, what's allow what, that's what allows them to hang on to walls or glass or whatever it is. Okay, so we'll start out just talking about the different phases of matter. Okay, so we're all familiar with these three phases. So we start from gas, liquid, and solid. In this particular case, we're talking about water. So we'll call them steam, water, and ice. But truly, they're just gas, liquid, and solid. We just have special names since they are, in fact, water. Okay, so let's look at a gas first. And one of the first things you'll notice with a gas is that we have just tons and tons and tons and tons of empty space. So everything I'm sort of just highlighting in red here, this is all empty space. Okay, so the particles are very, very far apart. And in fact, a gas is mostly made up of empty space. Okay, they have complete freedom of motion and they're in total disorder. Okay, so there's very little interaction. We would actually say no interaction between two molecules. That's what we mean by complete freedom of motion. In other words, one atom of a gas, so this molecule of the gas, this molecule of the gas, is not preventing the other from moving around. Same with this one. So really the only time they interact is when they may, so if it's moving and boom, they run into each other. Okay, that's really the only time they're going to interact. They're not really attracted to each other in any way. They're not keeping each other from moving. Okay, then we look at our sort of middle phase of water, uh, phase of matter here. So liquid water. Okay, so here we have particles that are close together and they're free to move around each other. Okay, but they do have some interaction. So they're free to move what we say relative to each other. Okay, so they can sort of slip by each other, they can turn maybe a little bit, and they can they can move within the water or within the liquid. Okay, but it's sort of they have to stay close to each other. Um, and whereas in the gas we have total disorder, meaning that there's absolutely no effect from one gas molecule to the other, here we have just some disorder. Okay, so there is some, some association between molecules. Okay, then we go to our most highly ordered form of matter, and that's just a solid. So here we have particles that are close together, and we say that the particles are essentially in fixed positions and that it's highly ordered. Okay, we say essentially fixed positions because we know that solid matter is still vibrating. So there is some motion in the matter, okay, but relative to each other, there's no motion, we could say. Okay, and you'll notice that it's highly ordered. So you see that all of these water molecules, so I'm just going to draw them as sort of a triangle. Okay, you can see they're all oriented in the exact same direction. Okay, so that's the type of order we're talking about. Okay, so in other words, one solid molecule, one solid water molecule, affects the others. Okay, it affects the ones around it. Whereas in liquid, you have some effect between water molecules, um, so they sort of have to break away from each other. And then in gas, we have no connection whatsoever. Okay, so we start from, this would be our least ordered matter, and this would be our most ordered form of matter. Okay, and we refer to these two phases in the box. We refer to these as the condensed phases. 
Okay, so if you condense a gas down back into a liquid, um, there's a reason we, you know, that's called condensation or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but these are condensed phases. So in other words, they aren't gases. Okay, a couple more properties here. So with a gas, it has an indefinite shape and an indefinite volume. Okay, so a gas is going to fill its container. And it'll fill the shape and the size of its container. Okay, so it doesn't matter if its container is a balloon that we blow into or if it's maybe the size of a planet or a room. Okay, so no matter what, a gas is going to continue um, to grow in shape and size to match its container. It's compressible. Okay, so we say that we can compress a gas. Uh, in other words, we can take all this empty space and reduce it. Okay, so we can squish two water molecules together or two gas molecules together because there's all that empty space. So if you ever have gone to the grocery store or wherever to get a helium balloon filled, so you've seen them um, reach over to these big gas cylinders. Those are usually around 3,000 psi or so, okay, and they're just packed full of helium okay, to put into your balloon. So the ability of the gas to compress is what allows such a thing to, to, be, uh, to take place. Okay, they have low density. Why do they have low density? Because remember we said they're mostly empty space. So if you were to, if you could shoot a dart at the atomic scale, right? If it hits here, 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 it's not going to hit anything, right? And that's because it's there's nothing there. Okay, so we have very low density, um, and we know that a gas will flow. Um, so we can actually a heavy gas. Maybe um, we could pour a heavy gas, or we could um, channel a gas through a tube or a pipe. Okay, so we, we say that a gas will flow. In other words, it's not, you know, we can we can push it through a pipe, we can push it through any, some kind of system. Okay, the next one, liquid water. So this has an indefinite shape. Okay, so again, liquid water will take on the shape of its container, or li any liquid, it doesn't have to be liquid water. Okay, so it has, it has, but it does have a fixed volume, whereas the gas has no fixed shape, no fixed volume, but now we have a liquid, now we have a fixed volume. We can't compress the liquid because look, there's not much, not much empty space here. It's highly dense. Okay, so the the chances of throwing a dart into a liquid and actually hitting a molecule is very high, and we know that it can flow. We know that we can pour things like water, okay, or other liquids. Okay, so again, it has indefinite shape but a fixed volume. Okay, and well, we'll we'll get to that in just a few moments. But then we look at solid. Okay, now we have a fixed shape and a fixed volume. Okay, so we can't alter the shape of a solid without actually breaking the bonds. Okay, it's not compressible, it's highly dense, and of course it won't flow. Um, there's actually an interesting experiment of a solid that will flow that you can look up. Um, it's, I forget how many years, 100 years or something, they've had this solid sitting in a funnel and eventually it will drip every so often and you can actually watch it on webcam um, I forget the exact name of the experiment, um, but it's pretty interesting. But for the most part, okay, solids don't flow. And they're not compressible, and we can't change their volume or shape without actually destroying some part of the bond. Okay, so what is it that makes matter stay in these different phases? Okay, so here we say that the state of matter depends largely on two competing factors. The first is the amount of kinetic energy, that is how much energy is in that piece of matter. Okay, so how much um, energy is with, contained within the molecules, the bonds, all these things. And generally this is um, mostly affected by heat, for instance. Okay, so the amount of kinetic energy within the molecules, within the matter, and secondly, the strength of the attractive forces between the particles. Okay, so we have strong forces that are connecting the different molecules together, the particles of matter together, or do we have weak forces connecting them? Okay, so the first one can vary. So the amount of kinetic energy. So this could vary in the form of temperature. I think that's the easiest one to understand. But there's other way it could vary as well. Okay, but the, the point is that we can alter that. Okay, but the strength of the attractive forces between the particles, this is fixed. In other words, it's going to depend on what type of matter we're talking about. So if we're talking about water, or are we talking about hydrogen, for instance? 
Okay, so that's going to be fixed depending on which molecule we're talking about. Okay, so let's take a look at this. So in the middle, we have a liquid. Okay, and I think it's best to start in the middle with this analogy. Okay, so if we take a liquid and we heat it, okay, so we increase the amount of kinetic energy. Okay, so moving left to right in this direction, or right to left, excuse me, we're adding heat. Okay, or we could be reducing the pressure, but let's think about it in terms of adding heat. So we all know what happens if you heat a liquid to you know, some extent. Eventually it will boil okay, and then turn into a gas. Okay, so we're going to change phases between liquid to a gas um, following this red arrow. Okay, and when we do that, now our kinetic energy is dominating. Okay, so here the kinetic term is vastly outweighing the attractive term. Okay, so we go from a liquid to a gas, and basically what we've done is we've put enough energy in to actually break those bonds that are holding the matter together, okay, the, the forces between individual particles. We've actually put enough energy in to cause them to break away from each other. And we can easily reverse this by just cooling it. Okay? So in the middle, we have kinetic and attractive energy, or uh, kinetic energy and attractive forces are similar. Okay, so if we pump heat in, we're going to give it more kinetic energy and break the bonds that way. And then similarly, if we take the liquid and we actually cool it, okay, now it becomes a solid. So this is like freezing water to make ice in your, in your freezer. Okay, so when we do this, now the attractive force dominates. Okay, so now we've taken molecules or particles that were loosely associated with each other in the liquid, and now we've really, really shored up those attraction. Okay, so we've taken all the kinetic energy out. Okay, so kinetic energy is, you know, very low. And so now our attractive forces can take over. And again, we can reverse this by just heating it up, just like we did before. So if we can cool it to freeze it, make it go from a liquid to a solid. We can also heat it, make it go from a solid to a liquid. So the, this first going from a liquid to a gas, this is like boiling water. Maybe you want to cook some pasta or something like that. Okay, the one on the right, this is more like making ice and then maybe letting that sit on the counter too long and it actually melting again. Okay, the point is we have either our kinetic energy dominating or our attractive forces dominating. But notice, depending on which term is dominating, changes the type of matter we have, or changes not the type of matter, but the phase of the matter. Okay, so let's talk about why that is. So. What do I mean by attractive forces? You know, what what does that mean? What type of forces are there? Well, what we what we're talking about is molecular attractions. Okay, so molecular attractions arrive from electrostatic attraction between attractive forces between opposite charges. Okay, so we have positive and negative particles, and of course we know a positive and a negative charge are attracted to each other. Okay, so one type of interaction we can have is this type of electrostatic interaction. Well, I shouldn't say one type. They're all based on this, okay, but we have different forms of it. Let's put it that way. Okay, so here we see water. And hopefully um, from having some a little bit of experience in drawing Lewis structures from last, uh, last semester and some information about forming dipoles, you know that in a water molecule, the hydrogen is partially positive, so that's why we use this lowercase delta and a plus, and the oxygen is actually partially negative. Okay, so we put a partial a lowercase delta with a negative, so a partial negative. So between two water molecules, we have essentially a big negative portion, and we essentially have a big positive portion. So just like up here. Yes, we have a positive and we have a negative. Well, what's going to happen? Those two are going to be attracted to each other. Okay, and then if I had another positive over here, okay, then we get an interaction there. If I have another negative here, those will, there'll be an interaction there. And if you notice when we were talking about solid water, you probably saw these same shapes. Remember I said that all the, sort of drew them as V's and they're all pointing in the same direction? Well, this is why. Okay, so all our positives and all our negatives are going to be attracted to each other. Okay, so if we want to melt ice, okay, so to melt the ice, it requires adding enough energy, in other words, heat, to overcome some of the attractions between the molecules. And notice we do say some. 
And we'll see why that is. Why do I put so much emphasis on the word some? Okay, so if I break down some of the attractions between the molecules, I get liquid water. But if I boil the water, now this requires adding enough energy to completely overcome all of the attractions between the molecules. Okay, so for an order, in order to cause the gas to actually escape, so in order for some of the water to escape being the liquid, it has to have enough energy to actually overcome. So if I'm a water molecule and I want to leave, okay, I have to overcome all those attractions that are pulling me back. Okay, so I have to put enough energy in to actually break those attractive forces, and then I can leave the matter. Because remember, we said that a liquid has a fixed volume. And this is why, because you have to overcome all of that those attractive forces in order to leave the liquid okay, and become a gas. Okay, so just to go from a solid to a liquid requires breaking some of the interactions, but to actually boil it requires breaking all of those interactions. So therefore, the higher the normal boiling point of a liquid, the stronger the intermolecular attractive forces. So if we have a higher boiling point, that means it's harder for individual molecules to break out of that of that liquid or whatever it is. Okay, so this is what we mean by the term intermolecular forces. So these are the attractions between molecules that hold them together. These forces are electrical in origin and result from the mutual attraction of unlike charges or the mutual repulsion of like charges. Okay, so inter meaning different, okay, between two different things. So intermolecular, so between two different molecules. And they're the forces, okay, so that one's easy. So they're the intermolecular forces, and there's a couple types. Okay, so we have ion dipole forces. Okay, and then we have what we call the van der Waals forces. Okay, so we have dipole dipole, London dispersion, and hydrogen bonding. Okay, so ion dipole obviously occurs when we have, these names are not that creative, so when we have an ion and a dipole, that's ion dipole forces. Within the van der Waals forces, we have a couple different types. So dipole dipole, just what it sounds like. So if we have two dipoles, okay, or we have dipoles in a molecule, then, you know, um, we have dipole-dipole interaction. London dispersion forces is kind of a weird one. We'll go over it. It's something you find in all types of matter. Um, and then hydrogen bonds um, sort of sounds exactly what it sounds like. Um, this is when we have hydrogen involved with a dipole. So it's kind of a, you could think of it as a special type of dipole interaction. First one we'll go over here is um, ion dipole. So again, this is just exactly what it sounds like. So if we have an ion in the presence of some molecules that have a dipole, okay, we can end up with ion dipole attractive forces. Okay, so this is a result of electrical interactions between an ion and the partial charges on a polar molecule. Okay, so here we have two examples. So we have an example where we have a negative ion and we have an example where we have a positive ion. Okay, remember that a negative ion is called an anion, and a positive ion is called a cation. So what will happen with the anion okay, is that the polar molecules will orient towards the ion so that the positive end, okay, so in other words, their partial positive end, will point towards the anion, so towards the negative charge. And if it's the other way around, then the negative end of the molecule will point towards the cation. Okay, so if for some reason I was to ask you what type of intermolecular forces was occurring here, well, you would look to see, okay, do I have a dipole? Do I have ions? Well, I must have ion dipole, and that's really all there is to it. Okay, so what about dipole-dipole forces? Okay, so dipole-dipole forces, dipole -dipole forces are the result of electrical interactions between permanent dipoles on neighboring molecules. And the, name, the, the term permanent is important here, and we'll see why in just a few minutes. Okay, so polar molecules have a permanent dipole. Okay, so if we have any type of polar molecule, that's known as what we call a permanent dipole. Okay, so this is mainly due to their bond polarity and their shape. Okay, so remember, in order to have a dipole, we have to have um, electronegative atoms that pull electrons to one side of the molecule, and it has to be somehow uneven share or uneven pooling. Okay, so the permanent dipole adds to the attractive forces between the molecules. And it raises the melting points and the boiling points relative to the nonpolar molecules 
of similar size and shape. So here we just have um, an example of a polar molecule. So this looks like it could be, oh, I don't know. Looks like we have an oxygen with some uh, carbon groups on there. Okay, but what we end up with is, okay, we have a dipole in this direction. Okay, so just as I've indicated. So what we see between two molecules like this, so if we have two similar molecules that both have the same dipole, or even if they have different dipoles, okay, those dipoles will line up just like we did with sort of with the ion dipole. So they're going to orientate themselves, okay, so that we have the negative end pointing towards the positive end. And we could keep going like this, okay, so they would just go on and on and on and in every direction. Okay, so that's all we have. So if we have a polar molecule that has a permanent dipole, then you know you can get dipole-dipole forces between the two. Okay, so why did I say in every direction? Well, that's because you know we have a 3D network of these molecules. We don't just have two, we actually have a 3D network. Okay, so what you'll end up seeing is you'll end up seeing clusters like this. Okay, so we have sort of a cluster of negative, sort of a cluster of positive, and you can kind of see that on and on, so another cluster of negative. Okay, so they're gonna orient themselves throughout the entire matter, or the entire sample of matter, okay, throughout the entire liquid, the gas, uh, you know, or solid, whatever it is, um, so that they're always oriented to maximize the attractive and negative and repulsive forces. So, um, if they were to um, get too close, or they're to put the, the negative charges too close, then those will start to repel. Okay, so they'll orient themselves in such a way they've maximized the attractive forces and minimized the repulsive forces. Okay, and just to take a, a look at some different uh, molecules here in the comparison of their dipole moments and their boiling points. Okay, first we start with propane. So this is just um, a hydrocarbon chain. So we have three carbons with some hydrogens around them. Okay, and let's notice our dipole is very, very small, so 0.1. Okay. And if we take a look at our boiling point, we have a boiling point of 231 Kelvin. Okay, and notice that these are all very similar molecular weight. So we'll learn later that molecular weight actually does impact our boiling point and our, uh, our and molecular forces. Okay, so that's why it's important to notice these are all very similar molecular weight. They're not all, all exactly the same. So what we're really looking at here is the change in dipole. Okay, so a 0 0.1 dipole with a 231 Kelvin boiling point. So look if we start to increase our dipole, so from here to here. We also start to increase our boiling point. And if we jump all the way to the bottom, okay, so going from 1.3 or 0 0.1 to 1.3, then all the way up to 3.9, notice how much our boiling point increases. So all the way to 355 Kelvin from 248. Okay, so Lesson of this is just that if we have stronger dipoles, we have stronger attraction, or we have stronger attraction between the molecules. Okay, so therefore our boiling point will be higher, of course. Okay, so if it takes more to rip a molecule away, well then of course we have to put in more energy. And how does that manifest? Well, it manifests as having a higher boiling point. Okay, so um, if this is your first time in my class. Um, what I like to do um, during these lectures is, um, what I would normally do in class is I would just pause speaking for a minute and let you work out these problems. Uh, so what I like to do with um, these video lectures is either you can just walk, watch me work through them, but I like to give you the opportunity to actually pause me talking and work out the problem and then I'll go over it with you. So you'll hear me say that a lot, you know, go ahead and pause the video or whatever. Um, and so that's just to give you an opportunity to try to work out the problem on your own. So that way you can see what you know and what you don't know. Okay, where are you getting stuck? Where are you not getting stuck? Okay, so this one we'll just go through together. Okay, so it says choose the substance in each pair with the higher boiling point. Okay, so I'll give you a second to look at this one. Okay, so we want to have the higher boiling point. So what's the first thing we need to look for? We need to look for things like dipoles. We need to look for, like, for things like ions. And what I see right away, so we have fluorine atoms here and here, and fluorine atoms here and here. Okay, so basically I have a dipole pulling in this direction, dipole pulling in this direction. Essentially we have not exactly a nonpolar molecule, but not, the, not a very polar molecule. Versus 
we have a big dipole here. Okay, so which would have the higher boiling point? Of course, it would be the one with the bigger dipole. Okay, so the more polar molecule, of course, will have the higher boiling point. Okay, the next one. Okay, so think about this one, see if you can come up with the answer. Okay, so again, take a look at your molecules. So here we have, again, this trans structure where these are pulling in opposite directions. Okay, pretty much canceling themselves out. Same as this situation up here. Okay, then we have a similar situation where we have a rather large dipole here. Okay, so which will have the bigger or the higher boiling point? Of course, the more polar molecule. Okay, so make sure you can spot things like that. You know, make sure you can are pretty good at writing in dipoles. Make sure that's pretty easy for you. Okay, you may need to go back and review that if it's not. Okay, the next type is London dispersion forces, okay, or LDF. Okay, and this is a force that arises from the result of motion of electrons, which gives the molecular a short-lived dipole moment, which induces temporary dipoles in neighboring molecules. So remember I said that dipole-dipole was between permanent dipoles? Well, this is why we make the distinction, because these are short-lived dipole moments. Okay, so a big important fact here, it's in big, huge red letters. Okay, don't forget this one. All molecules and atoms experience London dispersion forces. Okay, so it doesn't matter um, what other interactions are occurring, you always have LDF. Always, always, always. So if a question, for instance, asks you, um, you know, what interaction occurs between these two uh, molecules, you should always say LDF, even if there's no other force between them. Okay, it should always be a part of your answer. Okay, so how does this work? Okay, so here we have two helium atoms. So we have their two protons in their nucleus, and then two electrons swimming around. Okay, so we have electrons here, 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 and here. And these are pretty much symmetrical, so maybe we don't have much attraction between these two. Okay, but then what would happen if two of the electrons move to one side of the atom? So essentially, what have I created here? I've created a big negative charge. Okay, which will be attracted to the positive charge of the other nucleus. Okay, so th this is sort of short-lived, so as the electron swings over there, creates this dipole momentarily, okay, and then um, maybe the other atom follows suit. Okay, so now it also has a big negative, so we still have our negative here. So we have this attraction between the positive and the negative, and maybe we have another positive over here. Okay. And this is just a result of the spinning of the electrons, nothing else. Okay, so just the, pos the physical position of the electron around the atom creates this small short-lived dipole. And why do we say short-lived? You know, why isn't this a thing that occurs for, that goes on and on? Well, remember that these are atoms we're talking about. So the electrons are just whizzing around like crazy. Okay, so, but when we get into those certain situations, we can create these dipoles. Okay, it can occur between uh, molecules of any type. Okay, but back to our example here. So again, we sort of create this lattice work. Just if you remember back to um, our, our dipole dipole, where we sort of started to build this big lattice of positive and negative interaction. Same thing here. So an instantaneous dipole on any one helium atom induces instantaneous dipoles on neighboring atoms, which then attract one another. Okay, so in other words, we can build a network of these spontaneous dipoles. So we can, you can either call it a short-lived dipole or a spontaneous dipole. I learned it as being a spontaneous dipole, okay, meaning that it was induced, or an induced dipole is another way of saying it, uh, meaning that it's induced by other um, atoms. Okay, so the size of the induced dipole. Okay, so what makes these stronger or weaker? So the magnitude of the induced dipole depends on primarily on two factors. So the first one is polarizability. Okay, what is polarizability? So it's the ease with which an electron cloud can be deformed. In other words, how easily can we make it have a positive end and a negative end? Okay, so a larger molar mass means we have more electrons, which means we have a larger electron cloud, which means we have increased polarizability, which means we have stronger interactions. Okay, so bigger molar mass, more electrons, stronger attraction. Second thing is surface area. 
Okay, so if we have more surface-to-surface -surface contact, in other words, we have larger surface area, the larger the dipole is. Okay, and we'll look at some examples of su uh, surface area. Okay, but remember, larger molar mass, stronger attractions. And that's because the electron cloud is bigger, so there's more electrons to manipulate, uh, so therefore we have strong interactions. More surface area also gives you strong interactions. Okay, so first example, okay, so we just have moving from helium on down our noble gases. So notice that our molar mass is increasing as we go down. And notice what happens to our boiling point. So we start out at 4.2 Kelvin for the small helium atom. And then we jump all the way up to 165 as we increase our molar mass. And so you can see each step, we're increasing our molar mass. Okay, that was awful, sorry. Each time we're increasing our molar mass, and therefore we increase our boiling point as well. Okay, so bigger boiling point, more electrons, or I'm sorry, bigger, heavy, uh, heavier atom or heavier molecule, more electrons, stronger interactions. And one way we can look at that is just by looking at the boiling point. So why do we use boiling point so much? It's just one indicator. Because remember that we, these atoms have to rip apart from each other in order to boil. Okay. Second thing is surface area. Okay, so here we have pentane, which is a nonpolar organic molecule, and it has the molecular formula C5H12. Okay, so these 17 atoms can be connected together in structurally different ways, resulting in, resulting in different shaped molecules. Okay, so we can either have it in a chain, okay, so just as a long chain like this, okay, or we can have it so that they're all connected between a central carbon. Okay, so we have either n-pentane or neopentane. Okay, and what you see with these is that we have very different amounts of surface area. Okay, so if you imagine trying to move these close together. So if we have the chain type um, of molecule, or the chain type of pentane, we're able to get a very large surface area between the two. It's almost like, I don't know, mushing two pancakes together or something like that, okay? So we have a big high surface area. Whereas if we have neopentane, the structure is more like a sphere. So they actually, the amount that they can actually touch each other is very, very small. Okay, so we have very low surface area. Okay, so the higher the surface area, the stronger the interaction. So I like to think about this as kind of as like Legos. So the stronger you can click them together, the longer or the more you can, the longer of a brick you can snap together, the stronger the, the, the harder it will be to break apart. So it's kind of like that same thing. Um, so just remember, if you can stack them very closely, you'll have higher dispersion forces than if you can't. And if we take a look at their boiling points, that's indeed what we see. So exactly the same molecular mass, or molar mass, 72.15, 72.15. But notice the boiling point of n-pentane is 36.1 degrees C, and the boiling point of neopentane is 9.5 degrees C. So all we've done is just change the arrangement of the atoms, and therefore change the shape of the molecule, okay, and it increases our boiling point. Okay, so here, we have two things coming into play. So on our x-axis, we have molar mass. On our y, we have boiling point. And each time we make a step up, we're increasing the chain, the, the chain length. In other words, we're adding another carbon and then the hydrogens to go with it. Okay, and each time we do this, notice we increase our boiling point. So there's two things at play here. Not only, so remember I said that if you can stack them, the more you can stack together, the higher the boiling point. Okay, so the more we can stack together, the more surface interaction we have. But what are we also doing? We're also increasing the number of electrons. Okay, so higher molar mass, okay, more electrons coming together, so higher linear dispersion forces. It also allows for bigger surface area or bigger surface area. Okay, so that also increases the strength of the attraction. Okay, so bottom line, bigger molecules that can stack together nicely have stronger interaction between each other. Okay, so here's another one for us to try. Okay, well, we'll just walk through this one together. Okay, so it says choose the substance in each pair with the larger boiling point. Okay, so we have methane, and then we have C4H10, so butane. Okay, so which would have the higher boiling point? Okay, so take a second, think about the shape of each molecule. Think about trying to force them together. Okay, what do you come up with? So with methane, we have sort of this sphere kind of shape. So we know that stacking two spheres together, um, we have low surface area. 
Whereas with pentane, we have more like that box or oval shape. So we know that stacking those two together would have a, a huge surface area, okay, by comparison. So we know that, of course, butane has a higher boiling point. And notice that they're both nonpolar, so we had to go off London dispersion forces. Okay, next one. So we have hexane versus cyclohexane. So look at the molecules, look at their shape, and see what you come up with. Okay, so again, two nonpolar molecules. Okay, so which will have the higher boiling point? This one might surprise you a little bit because it kind of goes against, well, it's not that it goes against something, but it's something you may not know. Okay, so which one is going to be higher? Well, it's actually going to be cyclohexane. And that's because essentially what we have is, I'll try to draw this as best I can. As you can imagine, this is planar, so coming in and out of the board. Okay, so this part is coming towards you. The other part's going into the board. Okay, so essentially what you have is like, almost like two donuts stacking together, or two planes. Okay, so if you have this, this type of structure where you can stack them, almost stack almost the whole molecule on each other, that will have a, stronger forces compared to um, even a chain. This also has a double bond in it, which means it's fixed in orientation, so it can't bend as much, so that also helps to lower it. Okay, so that's why it would be this one instead. Okay, so that's really the one time, the one instance of that I can think of. Okay, so next one will be hydrogen bonding. Okay, so this is an attractive force between a hydrogen atom bonded to a very electronegative atom. So when we talk about electronegative atoms in this term, we're only looking at oxygen, nitrogen, fluorine, and an unshared electron pair on another electronegative atom. Okay, so we need two things. We need a hydrogen bonded to O, N, or F, and we need an unbonded electron pair. Okay, so we O, H, N, H, F, H. Okay, so oxygen, nitrogen, and fluorine strongly pull bonding electrons away from hydrogen. So it gives us a partial positive and a partial negative. In other words, we call this de-shielding. If we pull electrons away, we're de-shielding the proton. So therefore, the a lone pair on a neighboring molecule, okay, where it has sort of a negative charge, will be attracted to that positive charge. Okay, so you end up getting essentially a very, very special dipole-dipole interaction. So what you need is a hydrogen attached to an electronegative atom, and you also need a lone pair. Okay, so this gives you the partial negative. Okay. So you need an electronegative atom attached to a hydrogen, and you need a lone pair on the electronegative atom. Okay, so this is, um, this is why water bonds in this way. Okay, so we have Oxygen being electronegative, pulling electrons away from the hydrogens, giving us a partial positive, okay, giving our oxygen a partial negative, and that will be attracted to each other. Okay, and this forms these huge lattice works within water. Okay, and it, it kind of actually helps them find, especially in solid water, it helps them find this one particular position and they hang out in that position. Okay, so that's a result of your hydrogen bonding. So the easiest example to remember is with water, and just remember. Then in water, we have two lone pairs here. Okay, so that's where we get this hydrogen bonding from. So a hydrogen attached to an electronegative atom plus a lone pair on that electronegative atom. Okay, so some examples of things that can hydrogen bond. Um, here we have ethanol, we have dimethyl ether. Um, so one of these can hydrogen bond and one of them can't. So if you look at their boiling point, ethanol has a boiling point of 78.3 degrees C. Dimethyl ether, boiling point of minus 22 degrees C. Okay, so which one has the hydrogen bonding? Obviously ethanol. Why? Because we have an oxygen attached to a hydrogen, and then we know we have lone pairs. Okay, so that can give us hydrogen bonding. <coughs> Whereas on uh, diethyl, dimethyl ether, we have an oxygen we have an oxygen with, a, with a lone pairs, but there's no hydrogen, so we would need a hydrogen attached here. But we don't have that, so we don't get um, hydrogen bonding. But notice what an extremely different 
um, interaction this makes us have. So same formula, by the way, exact same formula, so same molecular mass, same everything. It's just the arrangement that's different. So arrangement plays a big key role in this. Okay, so not so dissimilar melting points, but their boiling points are crazy different. So this is way below room temperatures, below freezing of water even. Okay, and this is way above room temperature, so we'd have to actually heat this to get it to boil. Okay, so lone pair, so a, hy a hydrogen attached to an electronegative atom, and a lone pair on that electronegative atom. That gives you hydrogen bonding. Okay, and so coming back to water again, um, so one of the reasons we get these nice shapes and snowflakes is that water molecules in ice arrange, uh, arrange themselves to be an open reg uh, regular hexagon to optimize the H bonding. So in other words, to tr in order to try to maximize the bonding between water molecules, uh, this is the best shape, and this ends up giving us the nice snowflake uh, appearance. Okay, well, we have a bond length of about one angstrom. Okay, that's your average bond length. Okay, we don't have to dig too far into this, but notice that our hydrogen bond bond length is almost double that of a normal hydrogen-oxygen bond. Okay, so that's how we know it's not a true bond. Um, rather, it is this sort of intermolecular force interaction. If it was a real bond, then we would just call this molecule, you know, H2O4, something like that. Okay, but it's not a true bond, just an attraction. Okay, this is also one of the reasons um, that water expands when you freeze it. So everybody's probably done this. You you know get up for a run or something the next day, or you're gonna have a long day outside, and you throw a bottle of water in the freezer and you forget to let a little bit of the pressure out, and you come back in the morning and it's exploded. Okay, so again, water is going to try to maximize that distance. Um, between the water molecules it's, and not maximize but optimize the distance and it just so happens that one really interesting thing about water is that it actually swells when it freezes due to the optimization of that interaction okay and that's it actually becomes less dense and that's the reason we have solid water that floats on liquid water there's not too many examples of that uh, that uh, occur like this okay so not only does it expand but it actually floats on itself that's pretty cool okay and hopefully that will help you remember um, what hydrogen bonding is and how it works. Okay, so I'm not going to expect you to um, recreate the structure of DNA or anything like that, um, but just kind of interesting to point out here but that this is one of the ways that actual bonding in our DNA works. So you have all these different types of hydrogen bonding. So here we have thiamine, adenine, uh, cysteine, and guanine. Okay, these all have these hydrogen bonding interactions. So notice here one thing I do want to point out here is that here we have an NH, but it's hydrogen bonding with an oxygen. So the electronegative atoms don't have to be the same. Okay, they can be different atoms. You just need that interaction. So you need an um, electronegative atom with a hydrogen attached, and you need a lone pair. Okay? And this is what helps to form our strands of DNA. Okay, so just sort of a quick summary of our intermolecular forces. I didn't talk much about strength, okay, but this kind of sums up our strength force. So our weakest is our dispersion forces. Okay, these occur in all molecules, remember, so all molecules and atoms. These are our weakest forces, and remember they're from these instantaneous dipoles. Our next strongest is dipole-dipole, which occurs in polar molecules. Okay, and remember that's the attraction between um, the dipoles within a molecule. Next is hydrogen bonding. Okay, which we just went over this. We have to have an electronegative atom with a hydrogen attached and a lone pair on an electronegative atom. Okay, so that's our next strongest, and our strongest of all would be ion dipole. And this just occurs when we have polar molecules um, and ions in the same solution or in the same environment. Okay, so I'll come back to this for a second. Um, this would be something really, really good to have pretty much committed to memory. Just understand it. You don't have to recreate it, but understand all parts of it. Okay, so I'll be sure to study the slide. Okay, and lastly, let's go through this. So it says, suppose a substance in each pair that is a liquid at room temperature and the other is a gas. So we don't want to choose the substance that's liquid at room temperature and choose which one is the gas. Okay, so the first one we have CH3OH, it's methanol. 
and we have CH3, CH, F2. Okay, so which one is a gas at room temperature and which one is a liquid? Okay, so look at what possible types of bonding you have. Do we have hydrogen bonding? Do we just have London forces? What do we have? We have dipole-dipole. Okay, so hopefully in methanol you see that it can hydrogen bond. So we have an OH with a lone pair. Okay, and then hopefully in the fluorinated compound you know that it has dipole. So which is most likely a liquid at room temperature? Methanol, because we can form hydrogen bonds. Okay, the next one. We have an ether, and then we have a nitrogen compound. Okay, so which can hydrogen bond, which has London forces? Are there anything else in play that maybe we're not thinking about? Okay, so hopefully you were able to see that the nitrogen compound or nitrogen containing compound can hydrogen bond. Okay, so it's more likely to be a liquid at room temperature. Okay, so those are two answers. Okay, so I think that is a good place to end this first video, and we will pick up with properties of liquids in the next.